Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the MOOC NPTEL course on Bioengineering and Interface with Biology and Medicine. In the last few lectures, we have discussed about gene cloning, polymerase chain reaction and various DNA tools. What is so interesting to learn that currently the revolutions in gene and genomic technologies have started paying directly in the clinics. Lot of patients are getting benefited because of these genomic technologies. In order to illustrate some successful examples and to give you a message that how biotechnology, engineering technologies have started making its impact in the clinics, today we have invited a distinguished guest Dr. Nikhil Fudke to interact with you. Dr. Nikhil Fudke obtained his PhD from the Molecular and Cellular Biology, University of Michigan and Harbor in USA. He is currently the founder and head of a company GenePath DX in Pune. He and his team is involved in development of over 250 molecular assays in a state of the art lab in GenePath in Pune. He has years of experience in multidisciplinary collaborative research including clinical molecular genetic diagnostics, development of approved diagnostic tests and platforms. He has various collaborators and therefore his projects involved in different areas of oncology and hemato-oncology as well as infectious diseases. I definitely felt very impressed uh, with Dr. Nikhil Fadke's work and realized that whatever the latest advancement we see happening in uh, US clinics where patients can directly see the benefit of looking at the gene mutation, the sequencing analysis, those things Dr. Nikhil has brought very quickly back here uh, and those have been started making revolution in patient care. Today it is great pleasure to have Dr. Nikhil Fadke with us who is going to talk about clinical and commercial applications of molecular genetic diagnostics, the handy lab and Gene Path DX story. Welcome, Nikhil. Our story actually starts in a class very similar to this. Uh, two of my colleagues who were the co-founders of the company, uh, one is from IIT Mumbai and one is from IIT Chan. Uh, and this is, um, it's really a personal story. Uh, I, I've been teaching classes in medical schools and internationally. So, and I'm told that these are some of the brightest students in the country. So I'm sure you're all going to be superbly successful at whatever you do. Uh, it would be nice if you could also enjoy yourself by being, while being successful and make a positive impact on society while doing that. So if all these things happen, then it's, it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about myself. I trained at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. I worked in the medical school there and in the uh, science and engineering schools. Um, and Ann Arbor always has those pretty pictures up there uh, in the brochures, but really most of the time it's just full of snow. So we have two seasons, winter and construction. Anyway, so after uh, working there for uh, slaving day and night in the lab, uh, I got together with a bunch of my friends, many of whom were from IIT, um, and we set up a company known as Handy Lab, uh, and we built a molecular diagnostic platform, molecular diagnostic platform that integrated engineering principles, science principles, and medical principles all together. So um, really a melting of minds of different, different areas of specialization. And after we were successful with that, I came back to India uh, and started a company known as GenePath, which is focused on doing pretty much the same thing that we did in the US, but catering to the needs of Indian patients and Indian doctors. Okay. Uh, I come from a medical background. There's four generations of doctors in my uh, family on both sides. Uh, and we have a hospital that was started in 1945 uh, in Pune. And my lab is actually based out of there. So there was a motivation to get into medicine, but not actually do day-to-day -day medicine the way they'd been doing it. I was also interested in engineering, so nothing better to combine all those all those areas into one. 
Uh, my doctoral research was at the University of Michigan and I worked on genome sequencing before the human genome uh, project was uh, completed. And if you look at the people on, um, this is, yeah. So there's Craig Venter there, uh, that's me there. This is one of the projects that we did before the human genome project was completed. And we took almost two years to finish the sequencing of this genome. It was a lot of fun, but we were totally clueless at that point in time. But the two years is an important part to remember. Anyway, throughout my uh, PhD work, I did a lot of work on genomics, bioinformatics, and proteomics. And the nice thing is that even after all these years, many people are still quoting our research. So it, it remains relevant uh, even after all these years. Uh, but after I finished my PhD, a question that I had to ask myself and a question that you guys will be asking yourself at some point, what is it that really drives you and what is it that makes you really happy? Because you're going to spend more hours in a day doing than that than not doing it. So find out what really drives you. If it's photography, that's great. If it's making boatloads of money, that's great. Whatever it is. But find out what it is and then go after that. And if you need to take some time off to figure that out, do it. Uh, so mine were, I was really interested in interdisciplinary state of the art work. So I didn't want to do just medicine, just science, just engineering. I liked all that stuff coming together. Uh, I'm a geek basically at heart. And I also wanted to be able to impact individual patients. And there's no joy like seeing a patient come up to you and say, you know what sir, I had no idea what was wrong with my kid, but you guys have figured it out. There's nothing like it. I mean, that's an amazing uh, sort of motivation to keep you going through the day and the night. So these were my two motivations. They don't have to be your motivation. I'm just saying, figure out what yours is. Whatever it is, it's fine, but take the time to find out. So the first thing we did was Handy Lab. So Handy Lab was developing a microfluidic lab on a chip diagnostic platform. So a lot of the stuff Sanjeev has been teaching you about how you work with DNA, etc. These things are done in a lab. And there are lots of people in the lab with lots of expensive equipment. But if you look at a lab from the top, it's basically unit operations of fluid moving from one place to another. So you take some liquid, a blood sample, it goes into the lab, somebody might heat it up or cool it down or centrifuge it, stick it in a machine, you measure the pH or you measure the conductivity or you measure the optical properties, you combine it with something else. These are all unit operations. And what we did was automate all those unit operations on a microfluidic cartridge, that is a network of tubes and pipes inside a thin little chip. Unfortunately, I didn't bring it with me today. Uh, and the idea was to have a diagnosis in a completely automated manner at micro scale in a very short period of time. So one of the first tests that we developed in the US was a test for group B strep. Now group B strep is an infection that infects pregnant women uh, around the time of delivery and it can cause meningitis in the child and the child can die. Uh, the thing with that disease is that it can be treated with a simple single dose of penicillin up to four hours before the child is born. But the older test took 72 hours to do by growing it on a culture, microbiological culture. So you had to go in between 38 weeks, 37 to 38 weeks to get a swab. 72 hours later, they would tell you if it's not. And then they would give you antibiotics. Now you can lose the infection in that amount of time or gain a fresh infection. So that's a little bit of a problem. So we developed this test that gives a diagnosis in 45 minutes. It takes the sample, extracts the DNA from it, mixes it with all the reagents which are inside that cartridge, optics, everything built in and you get a result positive or negative in 45 minutes, okay? So that, to actually pull off something like that, we needed lots of diverse areas of expertise to come together. So one is microfluidic cartridges, designing them and manufacturing them. They have to be something that can be built for individual patients, not something that only works at a $1 million lab. Patients have to be able to get it. All the stuff that we moved on the chips was through thermoneumatic propulsion and control. So that means we would heat up areas of the chip, air pockets above that would expand and push liquid. By firing many of these different types of pumps on the chip, we could mix liquids together. We had gates and valves, so phase transition materials that are solid at one temperature, but when you heat it, they melt, and then you push an air pocket through so you can open a channel that was closed, and the reverse, when you have a closed channel, uh, or you can close a channel by forcing in wax from the side. So wax that is solid at normal temperature, but liquid when you heat it. So wax, gates, valves, etc. So this is like, um, I don't know if you can see it on this particular video here. But yeah, can you see that? Uh, that's the heating profile of the chip. So we're heating different areas of the chip. It's almost like one of those predator kind of movies, but this is a thermal image of, of the chip. 
uh, and we're pumping different areas, mixing liquids together. This is thermocycling for PCR. Um, here is some liquids mixing. Right there, you can see liquids mixing on the chip. So basically what is happening in a big lab is now happening in an automated manner out there. Uh, as I said, again, I keep stressing interdisciplinary. So people from physics, people from electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, chem E, molecular biology, business people, genetics, all working very tightly together to build all these technology. There was a huge number of patents. I've just shown four out here, a uh, large number of patents that were generated along the way. Um, and we took nearly 10 years to build this, nine years to build this. Um, so hard work, there's no, no substitute for hard work. But at the end of the day, you can make, uh, to be polite, a shitload of money. Uh, so it's, it's well worth doing. And if you're interested uh, in this kind of work, there is a huge reward at the end of it. Uh, the technology that we created um, was globally valuable. So Kyogen, which is one of the world's largest nucleic acid um, uh, sample prep companies, actually licensed our patents for their current generation of products. So. Uh, the idea is that people who are sitting here are going to pr make great things in lives, in their lives. And, you know, these are examples of things that you can do to be world leaders, not just the best in India. You'll be world leaders with the kind of work we do. Uh, so Beckton Dickinson bought over our product after we took it for an FDA. And they now uh, market it globally under the BD Max brand name. So having done that, I wanted to continue doing that, but to do something that was more relevant to our patients here in the context of Indian healthcare. And in India, unlike in the United States, patients pay out of their own pocket. And so they can't afford the same kind of things that they afford in the US. So we wanted the same high quality, they had to be reliable, but they needed to be relevant to the problems here, and they had to be affordable. And so we wanted to start by offering services, uh, and then go on to building devices and platforms. So go back to building what we did similar to the US, but do it in the context of India. So our company in Pune, is now in the service mode and we've just embarked into building devices. Okay, so service mode is there, it's a big market, we do this, we have over 350 molecular diagnostic tests um, in our lab right now, uh, but we are also starting to build products. Uh, keep stressing multidisciplinary, but here's our team, core team. We have MD, DM people, we have PhDs, uh, Karthik is from um, IITB and from Hopkins, uh, I'm from the University of Michigan, uh, Meenal and KT are MD path and clinical geneticist. Kavita is a mixture of a scientist and a uh, clinician. Uh, Pete is a bioinformatics person. So we all work very, very closely. Uh, we also have PhD students in our lab. So now to get to some examples and a little background. So Sanjeev has been teaching you about uh, the basis of you know, uh, DNA and uh, the basics of molecular biology. I'll just go through it really quick. In human information systems, um, information usually flows uni unidirectionally. Usually, there are some exceptions. Information goes from DNA to RNA to protein. So DNA is like a hard drive for your system. Uh, like you buy a new computer, all the information that you need is on the hard drive. But when you want to use a program, like I'm using PowerPoint right now, the information that is required is taken up into the RAM. Similarly, in biological systems, the information that is required at a given point in time is taken up into RNA. And finally, the effector molecules, like the outputs in a computer system, like you have a printer or a display. Similarly, the actual work is done by protein molecules. So information flows from DNA to RNA to protein. There are some exceptions. Retroviruses like HIV change the game. They go from RNA back to DNA and mess up the system. We also have interaction with the environment through uh, processes known as epigenetics. Uh, and epigenetics actually reversibly writes to the DNA and modulates how the DNA is converted into RNA. So there is more and more understanding. This is a very exciting area of research right now. So um, just that kind of, just keep that in mind. Uh, so where is this DNA and what, what is this DNA basically? So it's like an encyclopedia for each one of us, okay? It's like an encyclopedia with all the information you need uh, in your life, essentially, uh, how your body is going to react to its environment. And this information is a very long message. It's 10 to the 6 base pairs or 10 to the 6 letter of an alphabet. And the alphabet has got four letters, four types of letters, A, T, G, and C, unlike English, which has 26. Uh, now, this big, long message is actually divided into uh, 23 volumes from your father and 23 volumes from your mother. So think of it as an encyclopedia that's broken up into many volumes. 23 volumes from your father, 23 from your mother, so totally 46. Now, 
each one of these volumes is a chromosome. So you've heard of the word chromosome, the volumes of the encyclopedia are the chromosomes. Within every chromosome or within every um, uh, volume, there are paragraphs that make sense and the rest of the paragraphs that don't make sense. The parts of the paragraphs that make sense are the genes. So we have about 25,000 to 45,000 genes in our system. So that many paragraphs in there, they are distributed amongst the 23 chromosomes and you have two copies of each of these chromosomes, one from your father, one from your mother, except for the sex chromosomes, males have one X and one Y, females have two Xs. Uh, the interesting thing is that in this entire encyclopedia, only about 2% of it has known function today. This 2% is known as the exome and 85% of all mutations in our uh, disease, uh, sort of the diseases that we know and understand are located in that 2%. So that 2% becomes very, very important to study. So every time a cell divides, this entire encyclopedia gets replicated. Okay, six billion bases are getting replicated every time you make a copy of a cell. Mistakes will happen. We have machines to correct those mistakes, but sometimes those machines fail and you have the mistakes carried over. So what are the things that can go wrong? One is that, so I have an English sentence, uh, the dog bit the cat, the cat ate the rat. There's two copies of it, one from the father, one from the mother. This is how the sentence should normally look. You can one have an infection. You can have something coming from outside cow, pig, ass, whatever. That's not supposed to be in there. So it comes and messes up the meaning of the sentence. So that's foreign DNA or foreign nucleic acids coming in. You can have spelling mistakes which are single nucleotide polymorphism, SNPs. This is when a single alphabet or a single letter in the alphabet changes. So in the top case, you can actually understand the meaning of the sentence. So it doesn't really matter so much. But in the lower one, because the C has changed to a B, the entire meaning of the sentence has changed. So this SNPs can be bad they can be harmless, depending on where they happen, that's important. You can have insertions and deletions, that is addition of a letter into the message. These are almost always bad. Conditions like fragile X and Huntington's disease, they're really nasty diseases. They're often caused by insertions and deletions. And this is because when you say added this E there, the complete meaning of the sentence changes. Similarly, when you remove something, the meaning of the sentence changes. You can't recognize it anymore. You can have copy number variations where entire messages or parts of the message are replicated. You can have inversions where the message is flipped over. You can have translocations, which is like buying a cheap pirated book on the street. You're reading chapter nine, suddenly it goes to chapter 22. The sentence in itself makes sense, but overall the story is making no sense. So that sentence makes sense, makes a protein that doesn't really work well. Hell breaks loose, okay? Loss of heterozygosity uh, is very complicated. I'll skip it for now. So there's a lot of mistakes that can happen. You need to use the right tools to figure out what the mistake is. Uh, somebody will want to use the most complicated tool available and charge a huge arm and leg for it, but that doesn't make sense. So the right diagnostician has to understand the context of the disease, the molecular and the clinical background and pick the right test that is going to be relevant to the patient in, the, in a clinical relevant time. So the most all of our technology is based on two very major things. One is PCR, the polymerase chain reaction. Do you all know PCR? Have you all done it in this class? Briefly. So the polymerase chain reaction was invented by a total slacker known as Carrie Mallis who got the Nobel Prize. Uh, and everybody's still scratching their heads about why he got the Nobel, I mean, how he managed to pull up something so brilliant. But it's basically a system for photocopying DNA. It's like a Xerox machine. Uh, you take one molecule of DNA, it becomes two, it becomes four, it becomes eight, 16, and in a very short amount of time, half an hour, 45 minutes, you can make a billion copies of DNA from a single copy in a test tube, okay? And that is really the basis of almost everything that we do in the lab. The Watson and Bayes Crick pairing that he talked about where A pairs with T, G pairs with C is exploited by the PCR process. Again, this class is too short a time to explain and introduce PCR but it, it's the cornerstone of everything we do. Uh, you can couple PCR with a fluorescence event and monitor it in real time. So when there's more DNA, you get this S-shaped curve. The more to the left this is, the more starting material you had. So you can use that to detect whether infections were present, how much of it was present. If you had a mutation in a gene, what ratio of mutant to non-mutant. So this is uh, probably one of the most important techniques that we use in the lab day to day. The other one is capillary sequencing. And capillary sequencing, again, was a Nobel Prize winning uh, effort for Maxam and Gilbert as well as for Sanger. Uh, and it is a way to read DNA base by base, one by one. Now, 
Sanger sequencing has been the cornerstone of our sequencing abilities for a long, long time. Uh, and the Human Genome Project, which everybody must have heard of hopefully, was completed in 2002. It took 3,000 scientists 13 years and a cost of $3 billion to sequence the first human genome. Many countries across the world, they were all working day and night, these machines running by Sanger sequencing. Today, it is possible to sequence a single genome in under three days for $5,000. This has put Moore's law completely to shape. And this is because of a series of technologies known as next generation sequencing. Again, explaining next gen sequencing is beyond the context of this class, but it's a parallel process. So basically what you do is you take all your DNA, you fragment it into small pieces. Each small piece you clonally amplify and you sequence it individually. So our sequencers in the lab today can do 25 million sequencing reactions in parallel on a chip of this size. And the newer models that are coming can be 10, 100 times more powerful than that. So you break your DNA, you add adapter molecules to barcode them, you clonally amplify them, you sequence them in real time, capture the data, and then you put it back all together like a giant jigsaw puzzle. So because of the increase in computational power, this has been possible. But just think about it. 17 years ago, what took 13 years to do, today can be done in under three days. Okay, This is just mind-blowing. It, it just boggles the mind. And even that is only the start. Now we have these single molecule sequences, and we have some of these in our lab, which can take a single molecule of DNA, thread it through a nanopore, and read out the sequence in a matter of seconds. So they're going to further change this. So we use all of this. Uh, now this is over 350 tests that we have, but we use this for many, many different areas to actually manage patients. And I am going to give you very few examples of where this technology is used. Uh, so one very common use is in hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, okay? There are, I told you there are about 25 to 40,000 genes. And every time the DNA gets, uh, a cell divides, the entire DNA gets copied over. Now, there are some machines that prevent errors. And BRCA2 and BRCA1 are two examples of those machines that prevent errors. So when there are errors, they fix it. Unfortunately, sometimes these error correction mechanisms also fail. And so if you have a mutation or an error in one of these genes, you have as high as an 85% chance of getting cancer. Okay. So very, very high chance. Uh, and nearly 20 to 30% of all breast cancers and ovarian cancers seem to follow that kind of pattern. So, what are the advantages of genetically testing for this? One is that if you know that you have this mutation, you can modify your surveillance options. So you can go in for improved surveillance. And this is not only affecting women, men can also get prostate cancer, they can get breast cancer themselves, which is far, far more dangerous in men than in women. Uh, so we can have specific risk reduction measures. So we can have salpingoophorectomies, we can have bilateral mastectomies uh, and advanced surveillance. Uh, we can, depending on the mutation they have, decide whether they need to get radiation or not get radiation. Uh, once they have the cancer, we can change the therapy that they use. So if you have a BRCA mutation, we can use platinum-based salts. We can use PARP inhibitors, which are very new, exciting drugs. Some of our patients who have been using them were in sort of almost terminal stages, and now they've got a fresh lease of life. Uh, and we can figure the risk to other family members also. I won't get into details of individual patients because I think we're running out on time. Uh, but just the summary is basically of all the patients we have tested, nearly 40% of them had a change in clinical management after they did genetic testing. So you do the testing and what you would have done by the old method of medicine is no longer done. They would have some new uh, treatment options. Another very nice example of use of genetic testing is in CML, which is chronic myeloid leukemia. Chronic myeloid leukemia up to 15, 20 years ago used to kill over 90% of the people who got it. Today, thanks to a drug known as imatinib, 98% uh, of people have a normal healthy life. It's absolutely like magic. But to prescribe imatinib, you have to show that your chromosome 9 and 22 have fused. And we have a genetic test to do that. We test the patients, find out if they have that fusion. If they have that fusion, they get imatinib. Every three months, we monitor them to make sure they are responding correctly to that drug. As I said, 98% of patients do very well, but there are 2% of patients who don't do well. In that case, we sequence that translocated gene, we find different mutations in them, and based on those mutations, we switch them to other drugs. So some patients are switched to Nortilib, some patients switch to Desatinib, some patients have multiple mutations, and for those, you need a hematopoietic stem cell transplant. But this genetic information is actually being used for personalized medicine on a day-to-day -day basis, and that's pretty, pretty remarkable. 
so I give you an example from solid tumors, an uh, example from leukemia, blood cancer. It's also used in endocrine system. So here's an example of a two-month-old baby, uh, very high sugar at one month, uh, they initially being managed with two insulin shots a day, which is very, very painful for a you know, family of a small child. We went ahead and sequenced and found that there were two missense mutations in this ABCC8 gene. We knew how this gene behaves, so the child could be switched to an oral drug, sulfonylurea. The child stopped the insulin dosage and now is being orally treated, doing absolutely fine. So, is an example of this in action. Another example in uh, endocrine, two obese children, profoundly obese, 28.7 kilos at two and a half years, another one 18 kilos at 1.8 years, uh, went in and sequenced the MC4R and leptin genes. One patient had an MC4R mutation, the other one had a leptin mutation. Recombinant leptin is now available, so the child who had a leptin mutation, we could actually start that child on recombinant leptin, and that child is doing fine. So, there's an example of that. Completely switching tracks, we also do a lot of testing for infectious diseases using the same kind of DNA techniques. Here is an example of a patient who had an eye infection, okay, they were worried that this person would go blind, so they started the patient on antibacterials, antifungals and antivirus. This is like throwing the kitchen sink at the patient. Uh, in about 12 hours, we showed that it was not a fungus, it was not a virus, but it was a bacterium and 48 hours, within 48 hours, we showed it was stenotrophomonas maltophilia. This means that the drugs that they were, it has a different drug re uh, reaction profile, so they had to switch the drug, patient got fine, but they would have missed that because they only picked that up after five days by conventional uh, culture method. So, these genetic tools are really, really important. Uh, recently, there's been a spate of chikungunya and dengue in the state. In Pune, it's an insane epidemic. Um, and again, conventional testing was missing a huge amount. Using DNA and RNA based testing, we were able to show almost 70, almost 80 percent of our patients were positive and this can be diagnosed instantly, like within a day after you get the infection. One of our patients was even chikungunya and dengue positive, so that's great. Uh, and then, uh, at, at the start, I told you that when I started my career, uh, we sequenced the genome of Colobacter crescentus uh, as part of my PhD thesis and that took us nearly two years to do. Recently, we had a patient from Hinduja Hospital in Bombay with extended drug, uh, extensively drug resistant tuberculosis. And they said, can you do anything for us? Uh, and so they said, we sure, we can try and sequence the genome. So for about 12,000 rupees, we sequenced the entire genome of that patient. We found nine mutations that are corresponding to the XDR phenotype. And we did this in under two days, okay? So what took millions of dollars when I was a student, today can be done in days of like 12,000 rupees, which is like $200. So it's, it's just incredible. So there's just snapshots of examples. I can go on for hours, but I didn't want to waste your time. I have some take home messages for you guys before I go away. Take your time to find out what you're truly passionate about and what really motivates you because you're going to be spending a lot of time doing it. And cliched as though it might sound, there is absolutely no substitute for hard work. And don't pay attention to people around you who say you can't do something. You can almost always do something. When we started building that chip, everyone said sample prep is not possible. We succeeded in doing it. Uh, follow your heart and your instincts and don't follow the herd, you know, blaze your own path. Uh, multidisciplinary teamwork is the only way to go forward. Uh, get, uh, don't stay siloed in your small areas. Get together with smart, like-minded people from other areas, no matter what they are. In modern healthcare is really a team sport and doctors don't know this. They think they're all superstars and they want to score the goal themselves, but you need a strong team, you have to all work together. Uh, and Jugad is not a long-term solution. Everybody in India loves to do Jugad, but it just takes us back. You have to innovate and do real hard work. Jugad might take you three places ahead in the queue, but the entire line gets pulled backwards, so that doesn't help. And really figure out how you can positively impact society around you, rather than trying to reach out how you can reach the top of the pile, because in the long run, it is much more gratifying and rewarding. And there can be win-win solutions in my experience. You know, people always think that you have to screw somebody over to come up on top. You don't. Everybody can win and be really successful. So I've learned that in my journey. So that's it, really. Thank you for your time. Um, how you can research.